What's going on, guys? Welcome back to this week's episode of Outside the Arena with Mac and Griff. I'm Griffin Senek, joined by my co-host, Mac Rommel. And uh, once again, we're back with another episode. Um, honestly, it was kind of a quiet week. Baseball opening day did kick off, which obviously is very exciting. Final four also uh, tonight. Um, so stay tuned. Check out OTA clips for that one. Um, that will be live. Um, probably it'll be up when you're watching this. If you want to recap on the day's games, go ahead and check out our and subscribe to our second channel, OTA Clips. But before we start here, obviously, please drop a subscribe to this channel. We really appreciate it. We're trying to grow the channel a bit. We've got some big things in the work, big guests, all that stuff. We're going to keep growing. So, um, you know, stay tuned, join it now, as well as go subscribe uh, to our podcast on Apple Podcast and Spotify outside the arena over there. But today, uh, we're going to be doing um, a little bit of a first take style episode. We want to get some debate topics in there, but we're going to start today in the spirit of MLB opening day. We're going to do some MLB awards predictions. Uh, we're going to go through the MVP Cy Young Rookie of the Year and then as well as the Reliever of the Year, which is not a, a BBWA award, but we thought we'd do it nonetheless. We're going to skip Manager of the Year. That one's a bit you know, weird, but we're going to go through those four uh, and then we'll get into some of our stuff. So I just talked a lot to Mac. Um, why don't you kick us off? Which award do you want to start with? And why don't you give your picks for those awards? All right. So uh, do you want to go uh, league by league first? Or do you want to do, uh, I guess, MVP and just go in order? Of Whichever you want. I'm good with whatever. Whatever you prepped for. Whatever you're ready for. I guess we could do, uh, let's do league by league first, I guess. And I guess we could start off with MVP. You just talked a lot. So I'll start this one off. So American League MVP for me. I have it. Mike Trout for the Angels. Uh, he's a great player, of course, uh, and he already has three MVPs under his belt. So uh, he's obviously up there for a likely MVP candidate this year. He was also the runner up in four. I believe it's nine times he's been in total in the top five uh, for MVP. So this is a guy who's been doing it and he should be able to do it again this year. Yeah, um, I also have Mike Trout. I think it's a pretty easy pick for the AL. Um, you know, you just can't pick against them, really. Uh, and I think another guy you can't pick against, I know we're hopping kind of all over the place here, but I'm just going to throw it out because I think it's a pretty easy one and we'll probably be similar in this one. NL Cy Young Award winner. I got Jacob DeGrom. I think that's um, pretty easy yep. to say. Um, you know, I think, you know, he's obviously won the Cy Young two years in a row or not two years in a row, previously two years in a row, obviously Bauer won last year. But um, to me, no one can really contest him uh, for that. I just think he's the best pitcher in baseball. Um, and, you know, also I just want to throw out this idea that, you know, this idea that some people say Walker Bueller is going to win this award is just a joke. I mean, this guy has never pitched below a three ERA, I believe, in his career. Um, this guy is probably one of the most overrated players in baseball. He's great, but he's not a Cy Young kind of pitcher. I mean, he's not in DeGrom's stratosphere. So for people to say he's going to win the Cy Young to me just blows my mind. People still think this guy's going to just blow up, pitch to two ERA. It's not going to happen. Um, so I just had to throw that out there. Not a Walker Bueller hater, but just, you know, his height needs to, you know, relax in my eyes a little bit. But Jacob DeGrom, I know we hopped around, but uh, NL Cy Young, that's who I got. Yep, I completely agree with you there. I mean, DeGrom has become that dominant. I mean, not even just the level of being a Cy Young winner this year, but I mean, this guy is probably going to the Hall of Fame uh, in the future. Uh, he is that good. So this year, I have no question that he wins Cy Young. He easily throws 100 miles per hour with the two. 0.10 ERA. He has two Cy Young awards in the past three years. As you said, uh, this past year, he came in third, obviously, uh, but Jacob Grom, it's pretty easy for me. Yeah, I think it's easy, but we'll go jump back to the American League uh, for the rest of these awards. So Cy Young award winner. I'm going to flip this one back to you, Mac. Who do you got? I have Garrett Cole of my Yankees. So both New York team is getting a Cy Young award winner in this prediction. Uh, oh my gosh, my throat is bothering <laughs> You're in, you're in for a rough time. <laughs> yeah, but uh, past three seasons, he's finished top five. He's had a 2.79 ERA and 12.9 strikeouts per nine innings over the past three years. As I said, uh, this will be a full year for him with the Yankees. You're going to play the full, uh, a full length season. You're going to have fans in the stadium. I think that'll help contribute to his success a lot this year. So Garrett Cole for the Yankees uh, winning Cy Young in the American League for me. The shocker of uh, some viewers who know my uh, my baseball fandom, I'm also going with Garrett Cole to win the Cy Young in the American League. Um, you know, he had a good start opening day, um, you know, eight, nine strikeouts, something like that. Did give up two runs, but, um, you know, anything below three is quality start. So, um, you know, good start from him. But to me, you know, the reason he wins this to me is just 
I think there's a lack of pitching in the AL, and he's just, you know, clearly the best guy right now. I mean, you take a look. Blake Snell got traded this offseason. Trevor Bauer, or Trevor Bauer's in the NL, but um, Shane Bieber, um, to me, was a bit overrated. I think he's good, but I don't think he's, you know, on on Garrett Cole's level per se. He also, you know, in that 60 game season was playing the Central, um, you know, which all around for both leagues was, you know, the worst hitting division. Um, and you could see that both Cy Young winners came from uh, a team in the in the Central. So I think that plays. So I don't think Bieber's going to be quite a threat, but you just look at the level of pitching. I mean, Verlander's out. I mean, you could look at Grinky, uh, Tyler Glass now, Lucas Giolito, but those, and, you know, and Shane Bieber, obviously, but those are really only the main guys. So to me, Garrett Cole is just still the best pitcher uh, in the American League. I really don't think there's going to be much or m- any people that are really going to contest him here. Um, so for me, Garrett Cole will win this award. Um, still is not the best pitcher in New York or in baseball, but he will win this award. AL Cy Young, he'll get his first Cy Young, uh, and he did definitely deserve it that one year when, when he lost it to, uh, to Verlander when he was with Houston. But Garrett Cole will pick up that first Cy Young that he's been looking for. Yep, two New York pitchers getting the Cy Young in the National League and American League. And up next, we have the American League Rookie of the Year. I'll start off with this one. I have Randy Arozarena. I believe that's how I pronounce it. Yeah. Uh, of the Rays last year, uh, he carried Tampa Bay to the AL pennant. And uh, he set MLB postseason records last year. Ten home runs on 29 hits. In 64 total bases this year, he still has that rookie eligibility. Uh, so I think he has a great shot to win it this year with the Rays. Good pick. I like that one. I honestly didn't re- remember that. But uh, Bobby Dahlbeck of the Boston Red Sox. I don't know if that's him pronounced his last name, but Bobby Dahlbeck, uh, that's my guy. Um, I you know, This guy kind of reminds me of Pete Alonzo a little bit. Uh, you look at the stats last year. Eight home runs, 263 average, and 80 at bat. So the power is clearly there. Average, you know, home run every 10 at bat. Spring training, he was fantastic this year as well. I believe he had, you know, somewhere from six to eight home runs. I honestly don't know the specific amount. But you know, this kid has a lot of pop, good first baseman. Defensively, I think same, similar to Pete, could use a little work. I'm not the best there. Uh, I believe he might have even played third base at one point. That could be totally wrong. But uh, that's somewhat what I remember. But kid has a lot of pop. Um, you know, we'll see what happens there. But to me, AL um you know i like that another guy jared kalenic also from seattle obviously not up in the big leagues right now but that kid uh obviously trade in the infamous robinson cano deal uh, from the new york mets but he's a stud he's a you know good looking young man as well you know that guy's got a you know he's got a future in, in the league and off the field as well so good job jared kalenic um you know he'll be up in the big league soon and uh but i'm gonna stick with bobby big big b in boston big b in boston now our last award for the American League, and this is reliever of the year. This one was a bit tough for me because I didn't know much, but I gave it to Liam Hendricks of the White Sox, a 10-year veteran who, for most of his career, he was only good, but the last two seasons, he has become great. Uh, The Athletics closer, he pitched 110.1 innings innings across that period of time and had an ERA of 1.79 with uh, th- 13.1 uh, strikeouts per nine innings. He recorded 39 saves in uh, 47 save opportunities, which is also fantastic. So Liam Hendricks, one of the best relievers in the game, gets the award uh, for me in the American League. That's a good one. Um, I went with a little more of a low-key option. I went with Peter Fairbanks of the Tampa Bay Rays. Fairbanks, um, you know, hard-throwing right-handed pitcher. Um, you know, got some good work in, in the playoffs last year. I like him a lot. Um, you know, did struggle a tad in the World Series, I believe. But last year, pitched to a 2.70 ERA in 26 innings. Only gave up two home runs, which I like, too. Um, you know, I don't like guys who are prone to the long ball, um, you know, coming out of the bullpen. No, Peter Fairbanks, underrated guy, throws hard. And, you know, in that Tampa Bay system, we've seen what they can do with some of these relievers. I think Fairbanks could really be uh, something special out there. He's pitched two ga- in, in the two games so far, I believe. No runs allowed. So good start for Peter. Obviously not the closer, and this award does tend to go to closers, so he might struggle in that regard. But um, with Nick Anderson placed on the 60-day IL as well, he'll probably get more looks. Maybe he can get some save opportunities. We'll see, but uh, a little bit of a weird pick, but I think Fairbanks could have a huge year, so we'll go with him. Yep, and then now on to the National League. We covered Cy Young. We both agreed on Jacob DeGrom from the Mets uh, winning the Cy Young, of course. Uh, But National League MVP, I'll go. And I have Juan Soto uh, of the Nationals winning this, the 22-year-old. He's not only the best young hitter in the game, he's likely the best hitter in the game. Uh, And that just goes to show you how special this kid is at such a young age. He does it all at the plate last year. 
Uh, he led the National League with a 351 batting average, 490 on base percentage, and 695 slugging percentage. Juan Soto is an amazing hitter, and he will likely win the National League MVP. I went with Juan Soto as well. Um, you know, he's so talented. I hate, you know, this young talent in the NL East with, you know, him, Ronald Acuna. I mean, it's just horrible. You just look at him and you're just like, you just want to die in that scenario. But Soto isn't locked up. Acuna is. So maybe Soto will hit free agency. But like you said, Juan Soto, I mean, this kid's a superstar. You've seen it so far. Obviously, a World Series champion. He played great that year. Uh, last year, he hit like 350 something. You know, he led the NL in average. I mean, that's just ridiculous. Um, 13 homers, 50, 154 ABs. Obviously, the year before had like 34 homers, 110 RBIs, something crazy, maybe even more RBIs. Um, you know, if he puts the average in, in the hitting the end, I mean, this guy's going to really just demolish the baseball. Um, you know, it, him and Trey Turner, real consistent in that national lineup. A lot of other question marks for the Nats. Obviously, that first series with the Mets was postponed, was a bummer for sure. But, um, you know, Juan Soto. To me, as much as I hate to say it because he's in the division, this kid is a, you know, he's a superstar. And uh, I do believe he will win the MVP. A lot of uh, a lot of great positional talent, though. You can obviously look a lot of ways. You can go Acuna, Betts, Bellinger you could look at, Lindor you can now look at. Um, you can look at, I don't think Harper anymore. Harper's going to wash. But Yelich, too. I mean, Yelich is a stud. Um, Trevor Story is underrated. Arenado. I mean, there's so many good positional players in the NL. But Juan Soto, I think, uh, right now has it for me. Yep, so we're two for two so far in the National League. It's like we're yeah. predicting, oh, uh, was that the wide receivers or something? Yeah. In the NFL. Let's see if that continues with Rook of the Year. I have Cabrian Hayes of the Pirates winning Rook of the Year. If I had Smirk, I can't tell if that's, <laughs> that's Smirk that we got it. We got it similar or not, but we'll have to see in a minute. But in only 24 games at 24 years old in 2020, he pushed himself into the rookie of the year conversation. Uh, he finished sixth, sixth place, but he had a 376 batting average, 442 on base percentage, 682 slugging percentage with five home runs. Uh, as I said, he finished sixth, but he's still uh, able to get that rookie of the year this year. So Cabrian Hayes of the Pirates wins it for me. Yeah, it's it, this one's kind of chalk for me. Cabrian Hayes, I mean, this kid is, is literally, I think, a superstar that, you know, the Pittsburgh Pirates right now are in a, in a spot of shambles, to say the least, right now with their franchise. Do have some young talent. They got some good middle infielders, you know, somewhat good. But Cabrian Hayes is, is the bright spot there. You know, last year, like you said, I mean, this kid had 85 at bats, hit 376. I mean, that's ridiculous. Five home runs. So, I mean, if, you know, he almost, you know, 70 less ABs than Soto, but, you know, his pace was good. You know, already has a home run, hit one on opening day off uh, Kyle Hendricks, obviously the ace of the Cubs. Um, this kid's going to be a star. To me, you know, this kid is, is got the potential to be one of the best players in baseball. Um, definitely will be in the top two, three third baseman in the next few years, I think. I, I mean, I'm really high on this kid. So, yeah, I do believe he will win um, rookie of the year. And like you said, he already, you know, reached sixth and what, 85 at bats. They even play that many games. Imagine what a full season of this kid's going to do. I mean, it's going to be lethal. So. Um, you know, NL, not too many strong rookies either. I don't think this year. I mean, you got like Dylan Carlson and whatnot from the Cardinals, but um, not as high on him as Cabrian Hayes. So I'm going to go with uh, Pittsburgh, who uh, definitely needs some, some, something, something bright to look on. I mean, that team is going to stink this year. Yeah, something bright to look forward to. Or three for three, three for three. Let's see if we can make this four for four. I'm not sure how it'll turn up because I didn't know much about this one. So uh, we, it, this may be the one that is different. But reliever of the year, I have Brad Hand of the Nationals winning. Of course, he was formerly with the with the Indians, uh, and from 2016 to 2020, he had an ERA of a 2.70 and a solid strikeouts per nine innings with 12. 12 and last year with the Indians as I said he led all of baseball with with saves but uh of course leaving that stacked and great pitching staff with the Indians in Cleveland last year uh is going to be a misfortune for him and will be unfortunate unfor we'll have to see how that plays out as the season goes along but uh with that team that has so much star power on the mound I think Brad Hand could have a good shot at winning reliever of the year this year it's an interesting pick um I went you know with another lefty in the NL, teammate of the winner of last year's award, um, and that's Josh Hader. I think Josh Hader, you know, he's already won this award twice. He's one of the best relievers, if not the best reliever in baseball. Did struggle a little bit. I mean, he was – I'm pretty sure this guy, like, didn't give up a run for most of the season last year and then got, like, give a few runs. I think he had, like, eight runs last year or something like that, so nothing crazy. But, um, you know, this guy's a stud. He pitched, you know, obviously, you know, 
you know, sub two into ERA almost every year, strikes out a ton of hitters, dominant from the left side. I mean, you know, he's been in trade talks forever. If the Brewers struggle, he could get dealt at the deadline. I don't know what his future could hold. I wanted to go with maybe like an Edwin Diaz, but I was like, all right, I can't go fully with an Eric Matt, uh, you know, Diaz. Uh, definitely had a bounce back year last year. So excited to see what happens from him. But uh, I'm going to go Hater, already a two-time winner. Um, Devin Williams, his teammate is great. I think he's due to get a little roughed up after, you know, a year in the big leagues. Um, so Josh Hader to me, just so consistent, always at the top of his game. And uh, in a long-term season, when he had a short period of stru- a short period of struggle, you know, that will even itself out more than it did last year where, you know, it, it affected him obviously more great than uh, than it would in 162 games. So Josh Hader is my pick for the NL. Yep, so some great MLB predictions. We agreed on some of them, others we did not. Uh, but with that, uh, do you think we should move on? Or anything else you want to cover in baseball? Yeah, I think that's, you know, good uh, good segue to move on. Obviously, uh, we will keep up with some baseball stuff. We'll keep doing some baseball stuff throughout the season. Um, you know, it's a long season, though. You know, it's not going to be something. It's hard to talk about baseball, to be honest, you know, every day, um, you know, or every week. You know, if, you know, if big things do come up, big storylines. Um, you know, we'll cover it for sure. And uh, I mean, I love baseball. I can talk about baseball all day um, for sure. So um, definitely some baseball to come. But with that, we're going to go into a, kind of a first take style uh, part of the episode here. And it's going to be focused on the NFL. This is going to be strictly NFL from here on out. So with that, Mr. Mac Rommel or Mac Kellerman, the little Mac Kellerman oh. action. <laughs> um, you know, we're going to start. Uh, you know, with the first question of the day, Mac, I think you're a bit biased in this one, but maybe, I Mac, maybe. who will win the NFC East this upcoming season? You know, there's one main reason I have this pick, and it's, of course, going to be my Dallas Cowboys. And you look at every single team in the NFC East, <laughs> look at the quarterbacks. Only the Cowboys have the starting co- a real uh, and proven starting quarterback. The Giants, Daniel Jones, is he that quarterback? I don't know. Is uh, Ryan Fitzpatrick that quarterback? Absolutely not. He hasn't even made the playoffs once in his career, and you know how many teams he's played on, and he hasn't made the playoffs once. He's going to continue not making the playoffs with that team. And then, of course, the Eagles. We don't even have to talk about that damn team. They are so freaking bad. But the Cowboys, I'll start off. I'm going to make a few points on every single team. They have the offense. It's pretty obvious. They're probably going to have the top five offense, top three offense potentially, if healthy. That's obviously a no-brainer. It's whether or not could this defense uh, hang with some of these other teams and at least play solidly. You have to at least play average, above average, uh, and this team could actually make it pretty far. But uh, early on in the season, they weren't able to prove that. But in the past eight games, the last eight games, they were one of the better defenses in the league. Actually, they had the most takeaways in the NFL. I believe it was with 11 over that span. In this offseason, you added some play you had some death players like Carlos Basham. You had DeMonte KZ at safety. So that's obviously an upgrade over Xavier Woods. You had Keanu Neal, who could help a linebacker, which we all know is kind of lacking right now. Two years ago, this was arguably the best linebacker duo with uh, Jalen Smith and Lane Vander Esch. Uh, and now they've obviously fallen off. But Dan Quinn, he knows some of these two safeties. Oh, well, Keanu Neal will be playing linebacker. But I think that's going to be a big upgrade. He obviously started and was a big part of Legion Boom. So depending on how this draft goes, was the Cowboys can nail their picks defensively. You go cornerback in the first few rounds, uh, take cornerback the first few rounds, maybe draft another safety, add some depth from the D-line and at the linebacker position. The Cowboys could be pretty good this upcoming season defensively. Obviously not great, but average or above average is all you need with this defense to make it far. But for the Giants, uh, we all know they're a great team right now. You have all the pieces. You just signed a Dory Jackson, adding him with James Bradbury. Of course, you need those two corners to stop these offenses in the NFC East, which are obviously loaded. You have Terry McLaurin, Curtis Samuel for the Washington football team, for the Cowboys, CeeDee Lamb, Amari Cooper, Michael Gallup, and the list goes on and on. And we're going to see what the Philadelphia Eagles do in the draft. But you have plenty of players you're going to need to cover. And the Giants addressed that last year. They had the great defense. Of course, you're losing, uh, who was that, Dalvin Tomlinson, who was honestly a big part of that run defense, which is what made the Giants defense so special. So we're going to have to see how they fill that need. Could Dexter Lawrence step up? I am not sure. But they had the defense. Offensively, you had Kenny Galladay. You have Sterling Shepard. You have Darius Slane. But you have Saquon Barkley. He's coming back and healthy or not, this offense is going to have a massive upgrade and have a much better season. Uh, but offensive line, you have to see how they play. And the reason I'm not giving them this division is because of Daniel Jones. He hasn't been. He hasn't proven he's that quarterback. He hasn't proven he could take the next step and lead a team to the playoffs or 
even further. Uh, he hasn't shown that, and I'm not confident in saying that he could win this division and carry a team uh, to win this division if he hasn't shown it yet. I think this year will be a prove year for him. If he plays solidly, I think the Giants uh, in the future seasons in future seasons are going to be one of the better teams in the NFC if he steps it up. But if not, we've talked about this a lot. They're going to have to go out and find a new franchise quarterback for the football team we all know they have the elite defense but offensively you have Antonio Gibson you have Terry McLaurin you have Curtis Samuel you have all these players but Ryan Fitzpatrick he's not taking you to the playoffs and I'm guaranteeing you that right now and that's the reason why I'm not taking the Giants or the football team because of quarterbacks uh Eagles I'm not going to talk about them but Cowboys I fix up some things in the draft I think the Cowboys are in a brilliant spot uh for the future in, the, in this upcoming season yeah um the Washington football team is winning this division. Um, the Dallas Cowboys, to me, are just, you know, it's just, you know, the team is just not – I don't know how to put this. I don't think they're very – you know, they're good, but, you know, who knows what's going to happen. There's too many question marks. Dak Prescott coming off a huge injury. We have no idea what Dak Prescott's going to do. We know the arm strength, the talent's all there, but, you know, who knows what's going to happen? Who knows? Um, you know, Zeke, you know, he's getting washed, to be honest. You know, he's he's losing it. The O-line is it's paper at this point. I mean, w- w- who's to expect them not to fall apart within a few weeks? You know, C.D. Lamb, in my eyes, um, not proven yet. Um, I'm not impressed with C.D. Lamb, per almost se. Almost 1,000 yards with Andy Dalton. With Andy That's Dalton, almost 1,000 yards. Impressed. That's easy. I'm just not – yeah, because he's the third option on that team. At the end of the day, he should be getting 1,000 yards when on that stack of an offense. You know, Amari's great. Michael Gobbs, you know, good. Um, CeeDee Lamb, I, I'm just not sold on him as this you – know, I feel like Cowboys fans just build him out to be this superstar guy, this guy who's, you know, already built in. He's a Justin Jefferson, and he's just not Justin Jefferson. Jeff- Justin Jefferson, by far the best receiver in that class um, so far, and I think, you know, in the future, CeeDee Lamb's just not on that level right now. Um, you can look at roll, but, you know, CeeDee Lamb's just not done that much. I mean, he had some good games, but – other than that, you know, we'd put up donuts that week. So, and I'm not saying that's his fault. We got to see what he does this year with Dak Prescott. The defense is just a disaster for me. Um, you know, you probably lost your best player on that defense last year in Alden Smith. Um, you know, the, you know, Demarcus Lawrence didn't look good last year. Who's to say he'll bounce back? I mean, obviously you expect him to, but I mean, is Jalen Smith going to bounce back? Is Lane Vanderish going to bounce back? I mean, there's too many question marks. Um, you brought in the Falcons secondary you know, which wasn't very good last year. So I don't know why that's necessarily something that's celebrated. Good players and, you know, Keanu Neal or whatnot. But um, I don't think it's, you know, an answer. You lost Shadobi Awuzie. Um, you know, you lost your better corners on the team. So you still got to solve that. Um, so to me, Dallas is just not not built to win right now. Football team, you just look at the team and it's just it's just a better a better roster. Ryan Fitzpatrick, you know, he's a guy who has experience. I mean, look at when they won the division last year, who was starting their quarterback. Was Alex Smith a guy who, didn't even have a leg, essentially, um, you know, and really struggled. Um, so Fitzmagic, you know, he's a guy who's going to be able to run this offense. And I think a part that's really underrated, the guy who's really underrated on this offense is J.D. McKissick. J.D. McKissick, um, huge receiving back for this team last year. He lines up, you know, on the outside, inside, you know, whatever you want from him in slot. Um, you know, J.D. McKissick had a great year last year, and I think he's super undervalued um, and fits in well. You bring in Curtis Samuel, another guy who can do it all. I mean, that, you're going to be – people are going to be, you know, running scrambles. I mean, Dallas is not going to have any idea what to do in terms of guarding this offense with McLaurin, Samuel, J.D. McKissick, Antonio Gibson, they're going to be lost. You saw it on Thanksgiving. I mean, they have no idea what they're doing, basically. So, you know, sorry to your Dallas Cowboys. I'm shredding them a bit here. But that team is just not – the defense is just not going to be there. Um, and, you know, they're not really – and, I mean, look at the football team's defense. That The secondary highlighted by Kendall Fuller, Landon Collins, Cameron Curl, William Jackson. I mean, those are those are big-time names right there. Um, you know, their D-line, Chase Young. Jonathan Allen, Matt Ioannidis, Darren Payne, Montez Sweat. I mean, the names go on and on with this team, this defense. It's crazy, you know. And I think defense is gonna, you know, win teams this this division. I mean, if the football team is able to, you know, stop and, and the Giants' defense is good, if these teams are able to, you know, stop the the Cowboys' offense. You know, the Cowboys' defense is not gonna be able to hold these offenses per se. I mean, you know, Kenny Galladay, you know, Terry McLaurin, who's guarding them on Dallas? I mean, Trevon Diggs or whatever, you know, that guy's name is. He's a bum. At the end of the day, he's a bum. He's a scrub. <laughs> Uh, the hey. Giants, you know, if they if the Giants had a better quarterback, this is their division. I agree with you in that. I agree with your take on the Giants. You know, I think they're a good team. I'm not sold on Daniel Jones. If he shows signs of improvement, the Giants are probably going to win this division, to be honest. You know, if Daniel Jones can improve, it's their division to lose. Um, but if he stays this, you know, mediocre, below mediocre quarterback, this team is not going to do much. They're going to be a 6-7 win team. Um, so right now, I'll give it to Washington. Dallas, obviously, you know, they have the big names on offense. If their defense plays well, 
um, you know, they'll probably win the division too. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, cases. I just think, you know, will the Giants offense be there? I'm not so sure. Will the Dallas defense be there? I'm not so sure. Washington to me is just the best all around football team in this division uh, on both sides of the football. So um, I'm going to give it to them, but obviously um, if one of those scenarios happens, you know, those teams will probably end up winning the division. Yep, and I think especially uh, for this division, uh, the draft is really going to be what shapes these teams. How well do they draft, and who do they draft? Do they draft uh, players for position and need? Do they draft best player available? Available? Who knows? We're going to have to see, and I think this will be a good division to come back to after draft time once we see those positions and needs addressed or whoever they may get, and I think this goes for basically any division, but I think the NFC East is going to be the most uh, dependent division on the draft, and that's going to tell us what their future holds. But honestly, I think I'm not sure if you agree with me on this, but in the NFC East as a whole, I think in a few years, they were so bad the past few years. I think they have potential to be one of the best divisions in the league and maybe two, three years by now from now. I think it's hard to say right now because I mean, I think when you're talking about best divisions in the NFL, you know, one of those divisions for me would like, I like the AFC West. Like you've got a young Chargers team, a young Herbert. Mahomes in that, you know, that's a, that's a division I like, but for me right now, you got to look at the quarterbacks. I think the quarterbacks would be what decide that because those are the players that are, you know, staying there. I think the AFC North is another one, Burrow, Lamar, Baker, that's a division that's, you know, built to win. But with this division, I mean, the only guy who's really long-term going to be there for sure is Dak Prescott. Everyone else is a question mark. You know, we don't know Fitz magic's, you know, obviously not going to be there long-term Daniel Jones got to prove himself. Jalen hurts got to prove himself. So to me, I think the quarterback position has to be decided before we declare it you know, one of the more promising divisions in, in my eyes. All right. All right. Fair point. So you got the right, you got the football team. I have the Cowboys. I definitely know this will be something we address once again after yeah. the draft, but I guess we can move on to the next topic and that'll be the winner of the AFC. I know who you're going to get. I know who I'm going to take. And uh, I guess we should just first list off our teams before uh, we go in depth into it. I have the Chiefs and Griffin has the who's. Yeah, so for me, I, the way I looked at this question is I, I rephrased a little bit. I, I, I think of it as which young AFC quarterback will win the next Super Bowl. Uh, okay. And for me, um, I'm, you know, we're looking at, you know, a few of them. But for me, I'm looking at Baker Mayfield. And I think he's going to win the next Super Bowl in the AFC. As bold as that sounds. To me, this team is really built to win, and, and I really like their offseason so far. They've got their draft picks, and, you know, this team has done well in the draft. Their second-round pick last year, Grant Delpit, didn't play, so they're already getting a boost to the secondary. You signed Troy Hill, John Johnson, Tack McKinley, uh, Anthony Walker. These are good defensive moves. They need to upgrade. You essentially are getting Odell Beckham. That's another weapon back. They didn't have him for their playoff run. You can debate whether, you know, Baker's better or worse with Odell. I think Baker's huge year this year. You know, I think he's more comfortable now. I think he's had that experience. He won a playoff game. I don't think he's going to be as much, you know, looking for Odell as he did that, you know, first year with him. I think he's going to be more relaxed, take a more, you know, styled approach. Kevin Stefanski, such a good head coach. And with this team, I mean, the reason I'm really liking them to win the next Super Bowl, I just think they're built for the future. You look at that O-line, the young O-line. They have Conklin there for two more years. Petonio, probably going to retire Brown. Um, Willis is young. Treader getting up there in age and uh you know Wyatt Teller will need a big deal in the future but you know you got Chubb you got Hunt you got Jarvis you got I mean the options on offense are, are obviously there you got you know Hooper who knows if Njoku will be traded he's obviously demanded to trade like seven years in a row at this point now um Harrison Bryant is great there too but the D-line you got Garrett you got Ward I mean they've just got some young guys who are locked in um so for me you know I look at a team like the Chiefs who's you know super star studded but, you know, can they, you know, I'm looking at the win of the next Super Bowl. You know, I think the Cleveland Browns could take them. I mean, it's it's hard to say, but I feel like the Browns all around, you know, you look at the Cleveland Browns, who can take an injury better? The Cleveland Browns or the, uh, the Kansas City Chiefs? To me, if you look and you take away Travis Kelsey from the Chiefs and then you take away Odell Beckham from the Browns, who's going to be better? The Browns are going to be better set up for the future. You know, you got to take injuries into account here. And I don't, I, you know, I think the Chiefs, had that, you know, perfect season, no injuries, their Super Bowl year. You look at, you know, this year, um, they suffered injuries to their offensive line. And, you know, you look how that fared for them. They didn't really do too well. So for me, you know, I'm looking at this as which team is better set up, you know, for the future and to sustain an injury to one of your best players. King Brown showed that, you know, their best player, potentially on offense, one of their best players, he goes down, they're going to be fine. They can make the playoffs still. 
you know, the Chiefs, I, I don't believe the Chiefs without Travis Kelsey are just going to be that same team. I truly don't believe that. Buffalo Bills, another team in the mix. Obviously, the Ravens as well. The Ravens, to me, they're just lack a passing game. I just don't think they can get around that. I think the Cleveland Browns are going to be able to finally beat this team. They've struggled at times to beat the Baltimore Ravens. Um, really have had no success against them. They've, I'm, I'm not sure they've beaten them in the past two years. They might have beaten them once. I might be wrong. Um, they've really struggled. I think they're finally going to get the key to beat them. And in terms of the Buffalo Bills, I mean, I just am, I'm still worried about that rushing attack. Um, you know, their own line is, is not, you know, they, they have good guys there. Defense is, you know, it's solid. But to me, they didn't really add too much um, for me to be super confident in them winning the next Super Bowl. I still think they're, they're missing a, a piece or so um, to declare them. So I think Baker Mayfield and Cleveland Browns, I think you look at an all-around team, I think that team is, is built to win and potentially win the next Super Bowl. Yep. So before I go into my point, I want to ask you, when you're seeing a question and you're asking who will win the next Super Bowl, are you meaning who will win the AFC? What quarterback could lead their team to win the AFC? No. Or have a chance to go and be a team like the Buccaneers? I think it's a next Super Bowl championship is what I looked at the question. at. I think the next AFC is, you know, who knows what's going to happen. I mean, right now, who are the Super Bowl favorites? I mean, you can look at probably the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. They bring back all their starters. Yeah. Can that team beat that team? I mean, I think so. I think any of these teams are looking at in the AFC. I mean, I truly believe the Cleveland Browns right now are ready to win a Super Bowl. I think that team could win the Super Bowl this year. Obviously, health is a concern, um, you know, but like I said, I think, you know, this team has proved that, you know, outside of like a Miles Garrett, I think if you look at like a Miles, you, you can take away a few players on each team. Um, but, you know, once you really start, you know, I, I think – one, once one of your weapons goes away, you got to be able to win. I think the Cleveland Browns, you know, you look at look at running back. If Nick Chubb g- gets injured, Kareem Hunt just comes right in. I mean, that's that's yeah. huge for them in, in terms of their rushing attack. So I like their depth. I like I like what they've done, and uh, I think that I think they can truly win this, the next Super Bowl out of uh, out of an AFC team. Yep. For me, I mean, for me, it's really easily it's the Browns or it's the Chiefs. It's one of those two teams. I really can't count on the Bills as being one of the teams uh, that that'll go on to the AFC championship. I don't think any team in the AFC is up there with the Browns or per se the chiefs, but I love that point you mentioned. And honestly, I may have to agree with you on with this on with uh, this take completely. And I mean, I was kind of hoping we'd disagree on more of these, but <laughs> the, the point you made about injuries, I mean, I completely forgot about that, but that is, I think the best point you could have made or anyone could have made for who's winning the AFC um, this year. You mentioned all the players that they have uh, that can come and fill roles for players that are injured and the chiefs, they've proven that they cannot do that last year without Mitchell Swartz, without Mitch Mitchell Swartz and without their tackles, they could not do anything. They could not stop the Buccaneers at all. And I think the Browns, as you said, they have the young, really young offensive line, Jack Conklin, a bunch of other star started players. You have running backs who could block too and Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt and Nate. And they got Janovich, the fullback too. Yeah, so they have a bunch of players who could just do it all. And, I mean, for the Chiefs, uh, you, you have all the stars, as you said. You have Patrick Mahomes. We all know what he's going to do. We'll get him to, into him in a little bit. But Clyde edwards Alary, Jasper went the first-round uh, pick last year. Uh, he had the one good game, and he kind of dipped after that. He didn't, really didn't do much. They didn't get him involved. And I think that was more on the Chiefs coaching staff than it was on Clyde edwards Alaire. They just didn't get him involved after that first game. You have Tyree Kill, Nicole Hardman, you lost Sammy Watkins, you do have Byron Pringle. You have the speed, but I think the Browns, what they did, as you said, you add all these secondary guys and these additions, I don't think it's to win their division. They're obviously winning the, the division for me. I think it's to help and stop the Chiefs and win the AFC. You have Grant Delpit coming back, John Johnson. You have all these stars and Denzel Ward and all of your cornerbacks. You have the players that it takes in the secondary to stop this team. And not only mention the starters, you have backups, especially at the safety position, who could come in and make plays when your guys are tired. And I think that's so special. They're having a bad game. Come in, throw them in, and they could come in and make plays for the team, but the, the, I was about to say the Kelsey's the Chiefs. You have the players. It's just a matter of could you put it together as you have the past few years. Uh, now that you actually have a team you really have to compete against in the Cleveland Browns, the Browns, that offense is going to be special. Baker Mayfield proved with that supporting cast around him, he could do great things. OBJ is going to be back. Jarvis Landry's there. And I, I love the point you made about the tight ends. Uh, David Njoku, who knows if he is going to be there. But <laughs> I think he'll be there. I don't think they'll trade him. I really, it's like a weird thing at this point. Well, I, I should have I, I phrased that better. Who 
knows if he'll request the trade again, and who knows how well, I, I, I don't but, know what the situation is. Yeah, it's so weird. <laughs> like, in the past like well, three years, it's been he's requesting a trade. He's saying teams he wants to go. They're like get the f out of here. Like just make up your mind if you, if you want to. Maybe trade. after they went to the playoffs, though, he'll, he'll, he'll. I think I don't know. I mean, I feel for the guy. He obviously wants yeah. to go somewhere, get paid and whatnot. But I'll let you keep going. Yeah, but I mean, I'm also kind of thinking, like, even for the future of the Browns, just a little side note. I mean, now you're mentioning all these young star players that they've gone through yeah. the draft and in free agency. How are they going to pay these guys? I mean, you're seeing what the Chiefs are doing. They're obviously set to win now, but the Browns, are do they have the front office that knows how to manage money in the same way that the Chiefs do, uh, to be able to move money around to keep all these guys in a few years? I just want to bring up that point. I'm not sure if they're going to be able to do that, but right now I think the Browns uh, are set up best to win a Super Bowl and win the AFC with – their offense. So you changed your pick. Amazing defense. I mean, you brought up you brought up the the injuries, and I'm like, yep, that that's all for me. Every team's gonna have injuries. It's just a matter of who, a matter of who could fight the best with those injuries. And I think the Browns are easily the best team. Uh, I was about to say in the AFC, but you know what? Let's just give the whole league who could fight back uh, from injuries. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, and I do some- think their depth is. Uh, uh, their depth. Yeah, their depth is built. Um, you know, even at quarterback, I mean, you look at the quarterback position, they have Case Keenum there, a guy who's familiar with Kevin Stefanski and all those great years in Minnesota. I think he could even step in and run the offense. And, you know, we did see Chad Henney, but like Chad Henney or, or, I mean, Mitch Trubisky, I mean, the Bills did do a good job of, of getting some depth at quarterback. Um, I think the Bills just overall are missing a piece or two. I mean, we saw the Chiefs kind of just outclass them. Um, so for me, it's, I, 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 I mean, the Chiefs are hard. They're the big name team, but you look at a team that, you know, if they suffer some injuries, this team is going to be getting, you know, beat up. They're not going to be having the, the easiest time, I think, you know. Um, and, you know, they're, some of their guys are getting up there. I mean, Kelsey's getting old. Tyreek, you know, I hate to say, but he is due for an injury. I mean, some of these receivers, they all tend to go down. Tyreek has been healthy for a while. So um, we'll see what happens. I'm not going to doubt. I think if the Chiefs are healthy, though, it's Kansas City. But in terms of the whole look, um, you really got to consider a lot of things. And I think the Browns just in the end might be the best team and uh, the, the team that will end up winning that next Super Bowl. So we will see, but sticking, uh, do you have a final thing? You I was say just going to think with the, with the Bills and all these other teams, like uh, once we got to the playoffs, what was the one thing we kept on talking about? The run attack. That's all we yeah. kept on talking about. And I also think the Browns, they easily have the best running attack uh, in out of those three teams who are at the top of the AFC, and that's the Bills, Chiefs, and Browns, of course. I think they easily have the best running attack. The Chiefs, uh, last year, they proved they had none, uh, really, after that first game. You didn't get Clyde Edwards or Alaire involved. You didn't get Le'Veon Bell involved. And uh, even in the Super Bowl, you saw the team that was able to run the ball more and run the ball more efficiently. Uh, they won the game, and that was the Buccaneers. And every single game we talked about yeah. running the ball was what won it once it came time uh, to win a game in the postseason. Yeah, running the football, definitely an uh, important thing. But on the topic of Patrick Mahomes, we'll go to our next topic. We got, I believe, four more topics left. So um, we'll try and go a little quicker on maybe this one. I think we don't spend too much time on. Yeah. The question, Mac, can Pat Mahomes become the GOAT, obviously, the NFL, even – Oh, my God, I don't know what I just said. Even after his loss to Tom Brady, obviously the GOAT in the Super Bowl, you know, can he make up that ground after that loss and become the GOAT of the NFL? I mean, of course, it's hard to say how early on in his career it is, but I think it's very realistic. Everyone after the Super Bowl and even as Super Bowl was going on, they're like, if he loses the Super Bowl, he's not going to become the GOAT. He has no chance. You're looking back at the Super Bowls and his resume. He lost to Tom Brady, that's going to be the, the deciding factor. But uh, what you really got to look at is Tom Brady's beginning of his career, Patrick Mahomes' beginning of his career. I think Patrick Mahomes has had the better beginning thus far. And when you're coming and talking about Super Bowls, I think Patrick Mahomes has, has had much more success when it comes to Super Bowls in the beginning of his career. Tom Brady struggled early on. He didn't make Super Bowls or he didn't make his – make as many runs he has been in the past few years the past few years it was when he really took off and has been considered the go after all these Super Bowl runs he's been putting up at such an old age and I think the old age and uh once he gets to around mid 30s is where you're gonna have to start looking um if he's gonna be the go that's when Tom Brady took off and that's when people are starting to consider him the go because you have to remember just two three years ago people were still talking about is Aaron Rodgers the go is he better than Tom Brady you have to remember that and I think once you get up there in age that's when it's going to be the deciding factor and I think Patrick Mahomes of course he has the stats uh, early on in his career of course this isn't loading but um 
past few years. Uh, he had 5,000 yards 2018, 4,000 2019, 4,700 this past year. He puts up the numbers. He gets the touchdowns. Obviously, he had 50 in that 2018 season. So he gets the numbers, and he can easily, uh, over time, uh, be the leader in some of these stats could easily have the most passing yards in a career could easily have the most touchdowns in a career. We're just going to have to see as time goes on, but I do think there is a chance. And I think it's b- berserk really uh, for people to say he, there is no chance because of what we've seen with Tom Brady and uh, when he's been considered the goat throughout his career. Well, um, I'm going to be berserk then here and uh, he doesn't have a chance. Um, here's the thing. You look at Tom Brady right now. How old is he? Like 43 years old, 44 years old. The odds that Patrick Mahomes plays till that long is just not really likely. I mean, you look at the the list of quarterbacks that have played to this age and had sustained success, there's no one. It's one name, and it's Tom Brady. I mean, you can look at Drew Brees, but Drew Brees obviously a little younger um, than Brady, a few years for sure, I think at least. Um, So, I mean, it's just so hard for me to say. I think, you know, when we're going to talk about the GOAT later down the line in Pat Mahomes' career, If it's close, look what you're going to compare it to. You can look at stats, but they're going to say head-to-head. Look who who won these matchups. You can look at that AFC championship game, who won that year. That was Tom Brady. Um, Obviously, the year Mahomes made the Super Bowl, they never met. Um, I believe who won the regular season game that year. I know there was a – it might have been Brady. I think it was Brady that won that regular season game. Actually, let me look it up. I'm just going to look up the – But it doesn't matter because the thing that they'll look at is that AFC championship game and then the Super Bowl. That was probably Pat Mahomes' only – hey, Pat Mahomes, this was the Super Bowl that Pat Mahomes had to win. And I think he easily, if he won this one, he could have won probably five Super Bowls and then still be declared the GOAT because he won that one over Brady. And he likely will get the stats. I think the stats will be there. But another thing you got to factor into this discussion is health. Tom Brady, for most of his career, has been healthy. He's been on the field. I think he had that one year where he missed most of the season. But other than that, he's relatively been on the field. You know, you got to look at odds here. And realistically, there's a good chance that Pat Mahomes will miss more games than Brady. Brady's been really healthy. He's been on the field a ton. I mean, he's got that whole TB12 program going. Obviously, he's in weird shit and doing all that thing. But he's on the field at such an old age. Odds Patrick Mahomes is doing that to me is just not enough at that level of success. I think it's hard. I think the league right now is, is really competitive. I think there's a lot of good young quarterbacks coming in the league. I mean, talk about this draft class, which is, you know, we'll go on to our next question. You know, Trevor Lawrence, Zach Wilson, Justin Fields, you know, you can talk Mac Jones, Trey Lance, you know, you already got Lamar, Baker, Josh Allen, Kyler Murray, I mean, Russell Wilson still in the league and Roger still in the league. It's so hard. And for me, I just don't know if Pat Mahomes is going to be able to reach that six or seven Super Bowls that he's going to need um, to get there. I think I'll have the stats, but um, just out of, you know, how much time he has and, and likely when he'll end up retiring, I just don't see it likely. So I do not think Pat Mahomes can still be the GOAT. He can still be statistically the greatest player of all time, but overall greatest of all time. I just don't see it. I think Brady's going to have him beat in Super Bowls, and uh, it's going to be hard for Pat Mahomes to beat that. Brady could add number eight this year, too. I mean, who knows? Brady adds number eight. I mean, then I may have to consider a wrap, but also just talking about these matchups, who has the better quarterback really been when they've been playing? I mean, in the Super Bowl this past year, was Patrick Mahomes the reason they lost? No, he wasn't. Was Tom Brady the entire reason that they won? No, he wasn't. I mean, you look at the pressure that they were getting on Patrick Mahomes. But who Mahomes. won the game, though? I think that's what they're going to matter. I mean, who outplayed who? That's, what, the, the that's what people will think. But, I mean, that's not really what the truth should be. Patrick Mahomes, obviously, I think – I mean, Patrick Mahomes, when they've met, has just been – he's been outplayed, to be honest. I mean, obviously, you can look at that regular season game, but who's won the championship? I mean, at the end of the day, in the playoffs, yeah, I guess. 2-0 against them. I mean, you know, if it's close, you're going to look at record in the playoffs against each other, not – oh, who got screwed the most? You know, it's going to be record, 2-0. and oh. I mean, that's that's end of discussion. No one's going to care about, oh, well, he had his own line hurt that one game, and, oh, um, you know, there were some bad calls in the AFC Championship. And no, Tom Brady's 2-0 and oh at the end of the day, and there's no – I mean, that's a fact. I mean, there's no, like, dilly-dallying over that. I mean, he won a Super Bowl over him, and, you know, he got to another Super Bowl, which he won. So, um, you know, Tom Brady is the GOAT. I don't think Pat Mahomes can, can – find a way unless he beats him this year in the Super Bowl then it's a different discussion but if that happens then we're talking something else but um I don't know I think it's gonna be really hard and I just don't think he's gonna play into his late or mid or like in a few years into his 40s if 240 I don't know yep all right fair fair points I actually want to look something up real quick I could be wrong about this but do the Buccaneers play 
the Chiefs in this 2021 season, regular season? Probably not because they played last year. So probably I would doubt so, but maybe they did. I don't know. Let me just look that up real quick. I just want to make sure Chiefs 2021 schedule. I just want to make sure. Um, uh, if it takes this long to load. Um, they do not. Okay. All right. Yep. I was wrong. They don't play them this season, but okay. I guess we could go into our next quarterback discussion and it's with the third overall pick. Oh, uh, yes. 49ers. I mean, it's kind of seems obvious at this point right now who they're taking, but uh, right now we're going to be talking about who they should take and who they, uh, what, what was the wording we used? Who we think they should take and what would be the best fit for them or whatever, something like that. Cause I kind of have two different names depending on the situation, what I would do, but what they should do is I, I guess what uh, we should say and what we should call this uh, mm. topic here. Um, but I'll start off with what they should do. And I think what they should do is take Trey Lance. We obviously see the Mac Jones stock. We don't even have to get into it. Trey Lance uh, in 2019, he proved, yeah, wait, what's he? Yeah, that was 2019. He was obviously one of the best college quarterbacks. Uh, he led them to the D2 or whatever it was, uh, national championship. They won that, uh, whatever it is, uh, FBS, FBS whatever the other series is, but um, he put up the stats. He ran the ball great, and he's the stereotypical quarterback of what you're looking for in a future guy. Uh, but I, I'm really throwing out the stats. I mean, you don't even have to worry about the stats for why I think he fits there is uh, he's a guy who everyone believes uh, if he sits down and sits behind a quarterback for a year, uh, he could become that future great. I mean, you're talking about Patrick Mahomes, what he did. He sat behind for a year. Everyone thought he was going to be trash coming out of that draft. And look what happened with him sitting behind Alex Smith for a year. I mean, Alex Smith is obviously a different quarterback than Jimmy Garoppolo, but that obviously had a major impact on him. And I think Trey Lance, uh, similar things could happen with him, obviously not to the level of Patrick Mahomes, but I think that's the fit you're looking for with the 49ers, a team who said Jimmy Garoppolo is their quarterback for this year. And I think that's what sold it for me. And that's kind of the time in what they should do what they will do he's a quarterback that could sit behind jimmy garoppolo learn the system work with kyle shanahan obviously one of the better coaches in the league and i think that will help him develop into a great quarterback after they decide to get ready rid of jimmy garoppolo however if jimmy garoppolo was not said to be their quarterback for this year it's Justin Fields easily. I know that's probably going to be your pick, but Justin Fields, in my opinion, he's obviously the second, third best player or quarterback in this draft. I'm still kind of hung up between him and Zach Wilson, who I haven't been as high on until recently, but he proves he has the toughness to lead a team. He has the versatility. and I think he would fit great with the 49ers, a team who has that speed. They love the read options. They love excuse me, the end arounds. And it's all with speed. You have Debo Samuel, you have Brandon Ayuk, all these guys who are kind of gadget guys that mess around. And I think Justin Fields fits them perfectly. Uh, but that's only if he would come in and be that immediate starter. I don't know how he would feel about coming in and sitting behind Garoppolo for a year or however long it is. Uh, of course, I know you're probably going to mention how uh, you're not drafting guy for him to sit behind a quarterback for a year. But this is just what the 49ers have said. I'm just going based on what they said. And if things change, I think uh, Justin Fields easily easily should be the pick for them. But if you're getting a quarterback for the long term and who will sit behind a guy for the year, I think it'll be Trey Lance. Or it should be Trey Lance. Justin Fields is the right pick here. And honestly, it shouldn't even be a discussion. Um, you know, let's, let's just break down. The, let's break down the tape. You know, first of all, at the pro day, you look at the throws. I mean, the throws are great, but we already knew that from the Clemson game and, and just from, you know, his career as a whole. He ran a 4-4-4-40. Four, 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 um, he's the most athletic QB in this class by far. One of the most uh, athletic QBs potentially uh, to come out of college, one of the most underrated athletic QBs. That's somehow, you know, gone under the rug. Um, you know, ran the fastest, you know, combine or, you know, would be the fastest time since combine time since RG3 or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, um, you know, Kyler Lamar didn't do that. But another thing is this whole narrative that, you know, we can't get past this first option. I mean, it's just, it, it's maybe the most casual, you know, you see, I think it's the most thing for someone, you know, who might be, you know, you are casual if you say this, it's an absolute myth. I mean, here's, here's the staff here. Throws past the first read since 2019, minimum 60 attempts. The number one rating, yeah, well, number one passer. Before you say that, when I'm saying these and breaking this down with the players, Justin Fields, obviously, I believe is a better player, but who I think 
would be best for what the 49ers are looking for uh, right now. I thought that would be uh, mm-hmm. Trey Lance. But by, by far, Justin Fields is easily the better player, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, the thing that you said that I just disagree with is I don't think, you know, why would you take a project when you can take, you know, an all-star? I mean, it's like it's like finding a $100 bill on the streets and, and, and picking up, you know, a, a British $10 bill saying that, you know, it might have more value or something like that. I mean, it just makes no sense. It's, it's just, I mean, it's just, you know, look at one and you look at the other. I mean, here's the thing. But, um, yeah, that didn't make much sense, but I'm going with it. So here's my stat. I'm throws past the first read since 2019. Justin Fields is number one um, with a 90.6 rating, according to PFF. Number two is Zach Wilson, 90.1. So Zach Wilson, fairly um, strong with his past his first read. Trey Lance, third at 87.2. Trevor Lawrence is seventh with 78.6. And, and Mac Jones is eighth with 75.7. So, you know, first of all, Mac Jones, not athletic. Oh, and he's actually worse at throwing past the first read. Got carried by his, his wideouts. I mean, you look at that, four first-round wideouts. He played with the first-round running back, first-round caliber offensive lineman. Justin Fields played with one first round offensive lineman, maybe one offensive first round offensive wide receiver, a second round running back, third, fourth round tight ends. Um, so Mac Jones clearly had the better weapons. Um, you know, Justin Fields, you know, that, that first option thing, it's just bogus, honestly. Um, and you see that in the stats, you see, you know, he's the most athletic quarterback. So for this pick to be Mac Jones is it, you, you lose, the 49ers franchise is in the dumps if this is Mac Jones. Mac Jones is a fine player if you're taking him later as the fifth quarterback in this draft, not as the third or the third overall pick. That's that's idiocracy if Justin Fields is on the board. Even Trey Lance, I take. But now I want to go Justin Fields versus Trey Lance because to me that's what this pick should be about. You pick Trey Lance. So here's here's the team. Justin Fields over the past two years, 63 passing touchdowns, nine interceptions. That's not counting rushing. Obviously, Trey Lance had his year. He hasn't played in a year, though. So one year without athletic competition. Played in a bum conference, to be honest. I mean, he's not playing real competition. How many guys are going pro there? Not many. Not as athletic as Justin Fields. And it's just a fact. He's not going to run as fast to 40. Um, you know, he is a scrambler, but at the end of the day, he's not going to be as quick as, as athletic, per se. And he's not as NFL ready. You said it yourself. He's more of a project. He's a guy who's going to have to sit behind a quarterback for a year. Um, and who knows what's going to happen. Justin Fields has played against the Big Ten. He's won two Big Ten championships. He is one and two in the college football playoff. He only two games that he's lost, obviously, but you look at the teams he lost to a very, a a Clemson team where arguably he should have won the game. Um, A lot of misconceptions there. And, um, you know, an Alabama team that, you know, make no excuses for his injury or whatnot. That Alabama team was just fantastic. You can look at the tape. He has flaws. Everyone has flaws though. You look at Zach Wilson and the coastal Carolina game. Zach Wilson was not great that game. Trevor Lawrence against Ohio state this past year to me was not that great. Um, and you can, you can always find bad tape. So people are just so fixated on this tape of Zach, uh, Justin Fields against Northwestern and against Indiana. And I get it. The guy is not the best at times, but to say that Trey Lance or Mac Jones should be picked above him in my eyes, it's just idiocracy. I mean, why would you take someone who's worse and Mac Jones, why would you want someone as athletic as that? And just not even that talented. That guy, he's a good, accurate passer. But at the end of the day, for him to be discussed at the third overall selection, it's just ridiculous to say the least. So that's my take. It should be Justin Fields, and it really should not even be close. Mac Jones, I mean, this is my thoughts on him. Teams are basically going for, like, Tom Brady's, like, eighth cousin who like just got into football like that's what what it's not like to me like this kid he's literally rip off tom brady and you look at it every single time you're trying to get a rip off i mean it never freaking works not once it works mac jones i mean you're speaking of the players he has not only is he just like these guys are open every single play Every single play, you're not seeing him throw the contested ball. You're not seeing him throw the balls outside the numbers where true accuracy is determined. You're not seeing these things when it matters most. You're seeing him throw it to wide open players. It's basically you're playing in freaking practice with no defenders. That's what it's basically like with these wide receivers. And he's really just being a hand in this position, I feel, because he's at Alabama. I mean, it's beyond me why a team would consider Mac Jones at three. I mean, the only reason – he would go top 10 is because he's a quarterback and team needs quarter teams need quarterbacks. That is the only reason 
And look at his pro day. I mean, that overthrow that Jalen, I mean, not Jalen model, Devonta Smith on whatever route that was. I mean, that was terrible. You saw the coach, the look on the coach's face, Bill Belichick. And I believe that was even Kyle Shanahan who made a damn face too. They weren't impressed. So hopefully that just gets him out of the damn third spot. If I, I mean, I hope he goes number third. That just helps every single other team, but uh, <laughs> man, Mac Jones is terrible. He's, he's terrible. I, I've been saying it for such a long time. This kid is absolute freaking ass. He is yeah. ass. I Justin just think Fields. that this yeah. Justin Fields, I mean, look, I get Trey Lance, but to me, I mean, I just don't, I don't understand why a team would take a project over just someone that's, you know, it, it's just like you take like something that could be great, but there's no guarantee rather than taking something that's already a staff. It's like, would you rather have like a million dollars or invest, you know, seven thousand dollars in a stock that you know has some crazy potential but the odds it gets to that million dollar and passes it it's just not known you know that's my eyes it's kind of like a, it's a risky investment with the lands in my eyes just because he hasn't played in a year too i mean who knows you know how he'll do but you know mac jones is just crazy to me i mean it's it blows my mind that this guy he's not and i think maybe part of the problem is people are looking at him they're like oh, it's kind of like a Joe Burrow thing where he kind of emerges into the starter role, has good weapons, and, you know, is, is really talented. But Joe Burrow, you look at Joe I Burrow, he's – more of a Zach Wilson thing too. That Zach Wilson proved that more than Mac Jones has. Yeah. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm done talking about Mac Jones and, and this but, topic. We do need to move on. But... Real quick with Justin Fields too. I mean, you're seeing against Northwestern. I mean, you mentioned that as a bad game. But who's the cornerback? Who's their number one cornerback? Greg Newsom. Of course, Chris Olave is going to have – Really, Chris nothing. Olave was out. He wasn't even there. Or that, okay. Yeah, whatever. That, I forgot. Garrett that. Wilson. Yeah. So you're Wilson. basically you're basically throwing yeah, nope. having to throw new bombs. Yeah. Great defense too. You, you're not just having Greg Newsom going up getting drafted on that team. You're having other players too. And I mean, it's just be like the amount of talent that was out uh, for, for Ohio State, and you're blaming on Justin Fields. I mean, you put any quarterback in that situation. I mean, yeah. Imagine it this way. I mean, you have can look at the. Back have fun putting Mac Jones in for Ohio State uh, in that game. Have fun putting any other quarterback, Trevor Lawrence, whoever it may be, in that situ- situation for Ohio State, and they're all not going to succeed. Yeah, it's just, you know, we do need to move on. I don't want to make this too long. But uh, Mac Jones, to me, is just – you're just not looking at a right uh, selection. And I just took the score. The Baylor Bears are currently up 38-17. to 17 over I'm like, <laughs> So the Baylor Bears, um, you know, Houston's such a bum team. I said that in our last episode, but we need to move on. So final two questions. We actually uh, each made a question. We don't know it. So Mac, I'm going to start with you. Why don't you hit me with your, uh, hit your question. Then we're going to debate and we'll spend a few minutes over that. And then we'll go to mine. The only reason I'm, I, I mean, this topic is probably pretty easy for both of us, but um, it's just something I've heard. I've heard fans of this team talk about, it. I'm like, what the, f- I was about to say that for what the <laughs> hell are you even talking about? And it's, do the Patriots have a chance to make the playoffs? And I, I think no. In my opinion, no. You're competing against – okay, mm-hmm. by that face. I, I think they it. do. I think they do. Just look at the other teams in there. I mean, you're probably going to be third best in that division alone. So, you put Miami, you put Buffalo ahead of them. I, I, that's one wild card spot taken. I mean, you have teams like the Chargers – you have so many good teams in there. You have the Ravens, of course. I mean, the Steelers who could potentially do something, well, I doubt it. But, I mean, I think it's going to be between some teams and Patriots. They are going to fight for that wild card. I just don't think they're there yet. Cam Newton, that absolute piece of garbage, is not carrying a freaking team right now to the playoffs. You add Hunter Henry, you add John Smith, you add Henry Anderson, you add, uh, add Jalen Mills, I mean, Matthew Judon. You add all this talent for a damn quarterback who ain't going to do crap. I'm sorry, but as long as Ken Noon's that quarterback, you're not making the playoffs. It, it, it's not happening. I think this team will make the playoffs. I think they're a very good football team. And I think one thing you got to forget is this team is built on its defense. And last year, its defense wasn't particularly good. They were having, you know, obviously opt outs. And you look at the amount of guys they brought in. I mean, they brought in Judon. They're getting Dante Hightower back. You can look at that as basically a signing. They have a good secondary. Um, they've got, you know, new defensive linemen. Um, good linebacking core. When you look at that offense, I mean, they also brought back Van Noy. I mean, that went underrated. That's kind of went under the radar. He's a stud. Their offense, you know, you lose Joe Thune, you, you know, you re-sign like a David Andrews. They got good alignment. You bring back Trent Brown. Cam's a good quarterback. I mean, he's not good. I, I shouldn't say that. Cam Newton's not a good quarterback, but you know, his, 
his weapons are severely improved. And I think one thing that people have got to realize, you give this guy, Johnny Smith, Hunter Henry, statistically, and I've discussed this in the past, Cam Newton on those years when, when Carolina was good and their weapons weren't so good, look who he threw to. He threw to Greg Olson, the tight end. He used the tight end. He worked in the middle of the field, short routes to the tight end, and now he has two of the top tight ends in this league to throw to. I just don't think this team um, is going to miss the playoffs. I think, you know, there's, it's a 17 playoff. Now I think the bills will win this division. I think that's pretty self-explanatory to be honest, bro. Miami, like they didn't add too much. I mean, you add Will Fuller, but I'm still not sold on two attack Viola. We'll see what happens in the draft. And if Tua can, 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 can really do some stuff, but to me, Tua has not really impressed me too much. Um, you know, Ryan Fitzpatrick did get a lot of wins for that team and, and came in and into games. I mean, you look at that Raiders game, if they kept Tua in there the whole time, they don't win that game. Um, you know, there's just cases of this. So for me, Tua, I'm not sold on him. And uh, I just think New England all around. Bill Belichick is a good coach. They got that defense going this year. I think their offense will be improved. I do think that team is, is playoff ready. Championship, no. But playoff ready, I do think they can squeeze into a wild card. And, uh, you know, I don't think they can get a win necessarily. But um, I think they make the playoffs for sure. I, I, I definitely don't think it's a, oh, no, they won't make the playoffs. Not at all. I disagree with that. All right, fair point. I do think, say, I mean, if somehow a quarterback starts to fall and they could somehow pick it up. I think Mac Jones goes to them, they'll take Mac Jones for sure. Even if it's Mac Jones, I do think this team, you plug Mac Jones in, I think he should potentially. I mean, I think think Mac Mac Jones Jones needs to sit. He needs to sit a little bit. There could be a mini battle between those two. I'm not sure how, how it would play out, but I do think he would come in at one point in the season and be a better quarterback than Cam would at one point. I'm not entirely sure, but uh, either way, I do think if the team goes out and gets a quarterback in this draft somehow, uh, yes, they could make it, but you're, you're looking at other teams. Miami, I do think they're much better better than pay well not much better i think they are better than the patriots i've had i had to take away that much i had to take away that much real quick but i do think that they're better than the patriots they'll they'll uh, obviously get a wild card spot um you're looking at the afc north you have the browns Ravens, steelers uh the ravens should easily also get one of those i wouldn't even say the steelers are better than bro i think the steelers are missing the playoffs this year I, I don't think they're better. I think they're a team that can compete. I, I'm I'm iffy with the page. I'm just with the gut feeling I'm giving them a no. But I do think some of these teams they're going to be kind of battling out for. We're high on the Chargers. So I, I do think it's basically a lock for the Ravens and Dolphins to get uh, to those wild card spots. Dolphins, think, I'm not. It's not a lock in my I ass. think you're just giving it up for the third spot. And I mean, you're going to have teams like the Chargers who are high on. You improve that offensive line. I mean, that offense is going to be insane. Defensively, they have players that can get it done. You're going to have Derwin James. Hopefully, he can stay healthy you have players there and i think they're a team that could fight for that final spot uh what are some other teams i mean uh the Bengals. i do think if they have a solid draft they could i'm not entirely sure but then the colts titans could the titans add some things in the draft there for all their losses and whatever they've done this offseason you lost Corey davis some other players uh George jackson could you fill those roles and i do think they could fight for that last spot but for me uh, it's really who could fight for that final spot in the wild card for uh, the AFC, and I'm not entirely confident that it will be the Patriots that pull it out. Well, um, we'll have to see what happens. Obviously, will be interesting to see, but I do believe New England can squeak it out. But the final question of this episode and the day, we're hoping to have some guests on um, next week, the week after that. Um, still trying to work out specifics. It is a busy time for some of these guys we're trying to bring on, but uh, we'll keep working on it, keep trying to grow this channel. Mac. The question I'm going to ask you, and then I'll talk. Which NFL team that is, you know, perceived to be a contender, a team trying to compete right now in your eyes, which NFL team out of those groups needs to pack things up and, and I'm trying to phrase this, pack things up and just, you know, make way for a rebuild the most? So do you mean a team that will rebuild or a team that I don't? No, no, no. A team that right now is, you know, playoff caliber team that, you know, is looking to compete that should rebuild. Oh, oof. this is tough. I got I got to scroll through and think about this for a second. Do you want to give? Do you want me to give my answer? I'll let you go first. I got to think about this one. The Seattle Seahawks are the team that need to rebuild the most, and I'll give you my reasoning. First of all, let's look at the offensive line. The offensive line is non-existent. They don't really have any starters. I mean, they brought in, I believe. Gabe Jackson, that is the team he ended up on. I might be totally wrong, and I'm actually going to Google that because as I'm saying that, 
I don't know if that's true. Let me see. Gabe Jackson is on the Seahawks. So yes, they did acquire some help, but offensively, you don't really have much help and you can't really go out and get and spend the money. Your first round draft capital, you don't have a pick this year um, due to the Jamal Adams trade. Jamal Adams, not the best defensive player, to be honest. You do re-sign Carl Stunlap, but you got holes on the defensive line. You just lost Jaron Reed to the Chiefs. He was a big part of that defensive line. Bobby Wagner is aging. Um, Cornerback-wise, Shaq Griffin gone. He went to Jacksonville. Um, you know, you look at the offense, you did re-sign Lockett just now, but that's basically you're losing more money that you needed to spend elsewhere on Lockett. Um, you know, running back, they did bring out Chris Carson. You do have DK on a good deal. He's probably your best young player. Russell Wilson is unhappy. I mean, it, it just seems like the times are turning and it's time for a rebuild. There's a lot of pieces there, but to me, DK Metcalf is, is really the only guy who I'm looking at. I'm saying, this is the guy to build around. You have that young star building block, but other than that, I mean, I'm looking on the defensive side. Bobby Wagner's declining. Jamal Adams is good, but, you know, is he that, you know, super, superstar on that defense? Not per se. The D-line's getting weaker. The secondary's getting weaker as we speak. To me, the Seattle Seahawks team, they're just, they just need to go for a rebuild. Maybe trade that superstar Russell Wilson, get a ton of draft picks, and just reset your franchise. As hard as that might be for them to accept, I think it just might be time. I am still over here thinking about what team I should do. I mean, I'm trying so hard not to agree with you with the Seahawks. I mean, this really is tough. I mean, I just looking at the teams last year. I mean, the Steelers are honestly going to a freaking rebuild right now. It's so hard to pick a team. And I mean, I can't pick a team for right now. I mean, I may just have to pick a team you for can't pick a team. years, like two, three years. It's so hard to pick a team that needs to rebuild because you're looking at – the majority of these teams who are young um and i mean it's like all these teams are starting to come up at the same time right now i mean the browns they're starting to come up they're like they have years ahead of them. the chiefs they still have a few years ahead of them. the bills they have years ahead of them i mean the titans colts i mean they, they still need a rebuild you go packers you, go. I, I, the, the, I, you mentioned the team i was going to talk about I, I don't think right now is the time for them to do it. You still have the young talent. You still have some young talent guys who are in their prime per se. But I think in two to three years, the Packers are going to have to scrap things up and rebuild this team. This team is built around Aaron Rodgers. And once he's gone, I mean, who knows how long he'll be there now. He wants to stay there. The team obviously wants him to be there. But he's starting to age. He just came off an MVP season. Could he still perform at that level? And I think he will be for at least one or two more years before he starts to decline and uh, start to fall off a little bit, as we've seen with Drew Brees uh, in his last year or so. He hasn't been as good as he once was, and that's when he decided to retire. And I think once Aaron, Aaron Rodgers decides to retire, that's when you're going to have to scrap things up. I think it'll be about probably two, three years before that happens per se for this team. I think uh, he's not going to go anywhere else and play for another team as of right now. I think uh, once he's done with the Packers, uh, that'll be time when he hangs up the cleats. But once he's done, uh, you're going to have to build a team around that other man, and that is Jordan Love. I mean, they – I mean, what you hear about Jordan Love, I mean, coming into the draft, he's that big arm. And I think that's kind of what the Packers are hoping uh, he could come out and play like. I mean, if if you get that big arm in Jordan Love, I think he's going to be very similar to how Aaron Rodgers played. And you may not have to rebuild much. It's just going to be a matter of you have to get younger guys in here with all these guys entering their primes. I mean, Devontae Adams, he's probably got a good two, three years left in him before he starts uh, to fall off a little bit. He's in his prime right now, I believe 28 years old. But once he gets age 30, I mean, that's when receivers start to decline. You have to look uh, for some new receivers. And I mean, you can even start looking at that right now. In this year's draft, you still need a number two in there, and you're gonna hope that number two uh, de develops into a number one. But for me, right now, it's the Packers. You have guys defensively. Um, Kenny Clark's still relatively young, so you're gonna be able to kick, keep him. But Preston Smith, Cedaria Smith, guys who are starting to get older, you're gonna have to look to replace them. Uh, Jair Alexander, uh, could you pay him when his contract comes up? Kevin King, I mean, he's an ass number two corner. You're gonna have to rebuild around uh, that number two spot, but. Overall, I do think this team is starting to age. They're all in their prime right now, and that's why I think they're going to compete and contend for at least another two years. But, uh, I mean, after that, you're really going to have to start rebuilding some things around Jordan Love and uh, how he plays. Yeah, I was looking at the Packers, and the reason I didn't pick them is because they do have Jordan Love, and, you know, they do have some young pieces. So I feel like, you know, their rebuild might not be as hard per se. Another team um, before, you know, potentially re this up that I was looking at that, you know, I was like, ooh, that could be a good option. 
Vegas Raiders, um, a team that just seems to be reaching mediocrity every year. They're trying to compete. You know, they might not be in the playoffs every year, um, but I do believe they're trying to compete. I think they need a rebuild. I think they need a reset at the quarterback position. I think Derek Carr is kind of washed. Um, they're, you know, wide receiver position. Um, you know, they do have rugs, but he's not looking out. I mean, they do have Waller, who's great. They do have some younger linemen. They just extended Colton Miller, who's great. The defensive side, I mean, they kind of busted with some of these picks with Cleveland Farrell and Damon Arnett. They, they saw a glimpse of something. They tried to make it into, you know, uh, they reached really, to say the least. Um, didn't quite work out. They probably need to have a, Mike Mayock needs to uh, to reset his, his graph with re, uh, you know, outlook. Um, stop reaching for some of these guys. I mean, that's key. But to me, that team just needs a, just needs a reset. Um, you know, they need to accept things that, you know, they're not going to be a playoff team probably with Derek Carr um, under center with that big contract. Um, they just don't have enough money to go around and, you know, unless they really hit on some of these draft picks, which, you know, I think that's maybe what they try to do. They try to get fancy with it, try to get some fancy draft picks. Not that Henry Ruggs was one of those per se. Um, you know, he still got potential, but not in the way they used him last year. They, they misused him in my eyes, used him as a deep threat, but, um, you know, really just didn't use him to his full potential. And I think the Vegas Raiders are our team that is, uh, you know, probably headed to a rebuild um, likely soon. Um, so that's another team. I don't know if you have anything else you yeah. want to say if you want to wrap it up or uh, or whatnot, but that is kind of all I got for this. I have to quickly give another team that, I mean, they're trending downwards, and I think you got to just start dropping things and start rebuilding right now, and it's, it, it's the Chicago Bears. I mean, right now it's kind of looking like they're starting to lose pieces and trending towards that rebuild, but it's not like they're going in this overhaul to rebuild. Of course, they lost Kyle Fuller uh, to the Broncos, that was. Uh, I mean, and I think the biggest thing here with why this team needs to rebuild, you're bringing Andy Dalton in, and you're saying he's the starter like that is i think that's the dumbest decision they could have made i mean not signing him but saying he is the guaranteed starter. <laughs> they're hyping like, him up so much i mean like so many you walk him in for that starting position for this year that means you can't draft the guy you can't move up well you could draft the guy but he's not going to be starting it's kind of just wasting potential as you said uh, and i think for a guy that late in the draft uh Late in the draft, I think you're really only going to be able to trade it for like a Mac Jones type player if he starts to fall somehow. And I mean, he's going to be a guy that will have to sit. But overall, this team, Allen Robinson, I mean, he wants to be there. He says he wants to be there, but does he really want to be there? No, I don't think so. He's starting to get up there in age two. I believe he's 27, 28 at this point. Uh, I mean, you have young players like Darnell Mooney, who I think you should build his team around. Darnell Mooney, and then you obviously on defense, you have Roquan Smith, but Akeem Hicks, old, uh, Khalil Mack, getting old, Robert Quinn, old uh desmond trufant old and bum now and really a bum now eddie jackson in his prime right now but it's a team that really needs to start looking around and rebuilding a young amount um, around young players like darna mooney uh david Ra david montgomery and roquan smith but overall this team is getting old and they really need to just dip and start a rebuild yeah i completely agree with that and uh with that i think you can wrap this one up it's getting a little long so um, yeah, that's all I got to say. I think a good episode. And let us know if you guys like these first take style debate kind of episodes. I think it's pretty interesting to talk about some of these more broader topics and uh, just debate, you know, more general things. Um, so let us know what you think below. If you are still watching, we really appreciate you as well. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Hopefully we could add some other sports into this first take stuff. This was just kind of a, a last minute idea. So yeah. I didn't have time to prepare for some other uh, sports. Because <laughs> I, I would need only a little bit of time, a little bit. <laughs> prepare for those but uh hopefully in the upcoming weeks we should do some of the mlb nba whatever it may be and uh that would be great to put out for you guys but as always we appreciate you all who are watching make sure to like comment and subscribe not only on this channel but on ota clips where we have been pounding out march madness app episodes and we'll be putting out i believe two more now it's the final four we'll get that yep. one out tonight and tomorrow and then we have obviously the finals uh which is probably going to be the baylor bears and uh gonzaga at this point <laughs> yeah i think that's, that should be a lot but um uh make sure to go like comment subscribe there as well as follow us and subscribe to us on apple Podcasts and spotify uh we'd greatly appreciate it and then the best place to reach out to us aside from the comment section is on our instagrams please feel free to DM us uh, or whatever it may be just to talk if you guys want to come on. Uh, so reach out to us on our Instagrams, which are Mac.Rommel. Griffin's Instagram is uh, Griffin Senek. Our podcast Instagram is outside the arena podcast. So as I said, reach out to us there uh, regarding anything you guys want to talk about coming on and whatever it may be, just talking sports. But as always, we appreciate you all watching and we will see you all next week.